I'm Josh Klein. And I'm Elise Hugh. We host a podcast from Accenture called Built for Change. Every part of every business is being reinvented right now. That means companies are facing brand new pressures to use fast evolving technologies and address shifting consumer expectations. But with big changes come even bigger opportunities. We've talked with leaders from every corner of the business world to learn how they're harnessing change to totally reinvent their companies. And how you can do it too. Subscribe to Built for Change now so you don't miss an episode. I'm Ken Harbaugh, host of Warriors in Their Own Words. If you love listening to this show as much as I love hosting it, I think you'll really like the Medal of Honor podcast produced in partnership with the Medal of Honor Museum. Each episode talks about a genuine American hero and the actions that led to their receiving our nation's highest award for valor. They're just a few minutes each, so if you're looking for a show to fill time between these Warriors episodes, I think you'll love the Medal of Honor podcast. Search for the Medal of Honor podcast wherever you get your shows. Thanks. I'm Ken Harbaugh, host of Warriors in Their Own Words. In partnership with The Honor Project, we've brought this podcast back at a time when our nation needs these stories more than ever. Warriors in Their Own Words is our attempt to present an unvarnished, unsanitized truth of what we have asked of those who defend this nation. Thank you for listening, and by doing so, honoring those who have served. Today, we'll hear from Major James Dunning. Dunning served in the British Army during World War II as a commando and fought in the unsuccessful Dieppe Raid in August of 1942. In this first part of his interview, he describes how he became a commando and his engagements leading up to the Dieppe Raid. When one looks back from um, being 80 years of age, the reasons for joining that particular time seemed quite trivial. It was in 1937, 1938, when the Munich business was on, and... uh, Also, in the beginning of 1939, conscription was coming in England, and uh, I was working with my father in the family business, and I wasn't all that happy. And uh, one day I thought, I don't know, I've had enough of this. I think I'll uh, join the army. And uh, that's really just how it all happened. Within a few weeks, that and, and the great thing was, Joining then, I was able to make my own choice. Whereas if I'd waited another six to nine months, I would have been conscripted and had to join up wherever they wanted to put me. So that was really an impulse before the war, with the war clouds coming and frustration in the job and wanting to get away out of a family environment. There we are. And young and foolish, I joined. I wanted to be in, well, I joined an armoured car regiment, an armoured car regiment. They wanted the musicians too, and I was keen to play in the band and that, and so it all worked out very well. But then the war came, and that was the end of the, uh, that type of thing. It was just after Dunkirk when uh, Britain was alone, facing uh, the possibilities of invasion, and having not seen any action, I was then uh, 20 years of age. I was at a training school teaching map reading. And uh, there was a notice for volunteers for a special force. Uh, the details were quite brief. Able to swim, able to drive a car and a motorcycle, prepared to parachute, and also willing to be transported in a submarine. And... Uh, Still young and foolish, I thought, ah, oh, that sounds adventuresome. And uh, away I signed. I was a sergeant by that time. And uh, this seemed to be a good opportunity to get away from uh, uh, the classroom uh, training place I was in. And I volunteered. And it was simple as that. There were no tests or anything. One was just interviewed and either in or out. And I was in. Each troop leader, uh, having been chosen by the CO, was responsible for choosing his own two officers and his own 50 men. And 
looking back, I think each troop leader had different ideas. But in our particular case, uh, my troop leader, I think, looked for a person who was fit and in conversation probably conveyed that he had the right ideas of being prepared to have a go at anything. Uh, As I said earlier, it was ironic, really, because uh, one wasn't tested on any of the military skills that came later and was a disadvantage in many ways, as um, as it proved, you know, that uh, we had to then establish a training centre so before the people were drafted in to an operational commando, they all had a uh, an acceptable uh, standards of military proficiency and performances. When we volunteered, when I volunteered, the various commandos were set up all around the British, uh, the British Isles, because one of the things that Churchill laid down, who was the prime architect of uh, commandos, that no units could be spared from the vital task of defending Britain. So it was decided that they they aim at ten, raising ten commandos of five hundred men, and they would be formed in various parts of the British Isles so as not to denude any one area. And so we were formed in the south coast here, uh, not far from here, about 80 miles from here at Weymouth in Dorset. And we all mustered there. The most extraordinary thing uh, about the early commandos, they did not have barracks, no barracks. We arrived as volunteers. We were given a ration card because Britain, of course, all food was rationed, and an allowance of six shillings and eight pence, that's about 33 pence per day, and told, go and find somewhere to live. It's your responsibility to feed and water yourself, and as long as you're on parade at the right place at the right time tomorrow, no questions were asked. So that was the starting point, and then... The initial training was mainly to get fit, physically fit. Uh, the routine started with uh, at Weymouth. It was a lovely time of the year, July, beautiful summer of 1940, uh, clear blue skies most days, uh, right on the coast, one to go swimming. And half past six every morning while we're at Weymouth, a, a PT parade, an early morning swim and then back to our chosen billets for breakfast, and then the morning was spent on weapon training, rifle, brand gun, bayonet fighting, and uh, weapon skills, and uh, combined with route marches, and uh, uh, map reading, and so on. And right from the uh, first or second week, we started training for night operations. The blackout was on in, Brit- in wartime Britain, so that, and then there were raids, attack and searchlights, which gave a, a atmosphere of realism for uh, training of uh, the type we were uh, proposing to put into action. Uh, most veterans will look back when they will say, without any shadow of doubt, that their most arduous and mentally taxing uh, pieces of the training were the speed marches. And it was not so much, well, just as much physical, but uh, equally mental. You've got to make that mental barrier when you go on, when the flesh is uh, inclined to give in. Some mental things in the mind. And that was the toughest part, the speed march. Uh, looking back, the, f- the first few months, no, I think most people, most people, found it uh, progressively acceptable, but those who couldn't make the grade without any compunction were returned to their own unit, where it be infantry, tanks, artillery, or whatever. That was a great thing throughout all commandos, the RTU system, return to unit. If a person was physically unable or mentally unable or a whinger, a moaner, and didn't fit in with the team. He was without any uh, redress whatsoever, RTU'd. We were the first people 
after Dunkirk to get the uh, uh, United States Thompson submachine gun, which we had previously only seen in James Cagney films and Edward G. Robinson. Uh, and uh, they had a tremendous impact on the weapon training because being a short-range carbine, it was fundamentally fired from the hip and in small bursts. And uh, once we got those, we said to uh, ourselves, right, we fired this weapon from the hip, why can't we find, fire a light machine gun from the hip, the Bren gun or the rifle? And that all fitted in with the development of aggressive, offensive methods of fighting because previously a lot of the weapon training had been done on what you might call World, uh, World War I and Boer War style of training. Adapt a nice firing position on the ground, everything fine. And it wasn't really geared for modern warfare where you had to fire your weapon under all circumstances and from all positions. A Bren gun was a light machine gun which had been invented in Czechoslovakia in the mid-30s and was adopted by the British Army in the late 30s as the standard infantry light machine gun to replace the old Maxim and an in-between the rifle and the Vickers machine gun. Uh, so basically we had just the basic infantry small arms, rifle, Ren gun, Tommy gun, and a variety of grenades. Later on, when the role of commandos was altered, we uh, had heavier weapons. First of all was the two-inch mortar, and then the three-inch mortar and the Vickers machine gun. I have admitted one very cumbersome weapon which we had, and that was known as the Boys Anti-Tank Rifle, a very unpopular weapon. Heavy, fired a uh, armor-piercing uh, round, uh, had a kick like a mule, the actual gun, it was bolt-operated, and uh, it was very useful for light against light tanks, but mainly used against uh, emplacements and pillboxes and that. And that was eventually replaced by a piet, which was a, a projectile, which uh, fired a uh, shell, which a hollow charge, which punch a hole into a, a tank or a, an emplacement. The Fairborn and Sykes, uh, they're amazing characters. Fairborn and Sykes, two Shanghai policemen. Uh, they came back. They were quite middle-aged men. We thought they were quite old. And they came to a place called Loch Islet, which was the forerunner of Achna Curry, and uh, up in the highlands. Uh, Loch Islet was started uh, almost by accident. Uh, Loch Islet was the first special training centre in Britain. And it came, as I say, almost by accident, in as much as uh, in late 1939, 40, the Russians had invaded Finland and the British government decided to send a small token force to help them the Finns. And so they called for people who could ski. And uh, as one would expect, most of the people that could ski were people who had the means to go skiing before the war, which was very limited. And as a number of, well, some several hundred people volunteered, but they were mainly officers. And uh, they were, uh, unless they were a regular officer, they had to relinquish their wartime commission. But anyway, they was got together, sent to the south of France, trained with the uh, Alpin chasseurs, the French mountain troops, and then they came back. And when they came back, unfortunately, by that time, the Finns had capitulated and there was no need and among these people that had volunteered were some very adventuresome types. There were two brothers called the Sterling Brothers, uh, one who became the founder, well, he became a commando and then the founder of the SAS and other characters like that. And they decided that they would spend their leave up in Scotland 
at one of the lodges of the Sterling Brothers in the Highlands. And while they were there, they had what you might call an ear in the corridors of power, and they decided they'd try and get a private army to do a raid in Norway. And uh, they set off. They did get to some rain, but it broke down and they came back. And when they came back, they said, well, we must get together and start a special training centre. And that's how La Kailet was started. And among the people they got very quickly were these two ex-Shanghai policemen, Alfairman and Sykes, who had started the Shanghai riot squad. And they introduced unarmed combat, close quarter combat, to the British Army and also introduce a famous uh, FS fighting knife, uh, which is uh, here today. I went to Loch Islet and did a demolition course under uh, a man called Mad Mike Calvert, who would claim to teach you to blow up everything from a brigadier to a battleship. And so, but while I was up there doing my demolition course, I had sight of and rub shoulders with people who were doing that particular course as opposed to my course on demolitions. Mad Mike Calvert, he was a sapper, a, a royal engineer, and he was a qualified uh, uh, explosive expert, and he taught um, explosives until after the Lockhart had got established, a lot of instructors like Stirl, um, when the commandos were formed, because the Loch Islet was formed before the commandos, but only a few months. They got established, and some of them, like the Sterling brothers, Lord Lovett was up there, he taught field craft, and uh, that they uh, decided to volunteer for commandos. And uh, Mad Mike, he didn't initially, he kept on uh, teaching demolitions, and then they decided they wanted some of these uh, uh, irregular warfare expert uh, tutors to go to the Far East to help with Wingate and the Chindits. And my, Mad Mike then left Britain, left Loch Islet, and went over to the Far East and became a uh, commander of one of the columns of Wingate's first expedition in the jungle. But he was a mad character and hence his nickname, Mad Mike. F.S. Knife was a fighting knife invented by Fair Bernard Sykes, nicely balanced. It became, and still is, the emblem of the commandos. The Royal Marine commanders of today have their shoulder thing of fighting knife. Uh, and uh, Fair Bernard Sykes taught one how to uh, handle the knife, I would say it was re very rarely used in uh, action, but um, it was one of those things which inculcated the right fighting offensive spirit, which was possibly lacking in the wartime, in the peacetime army. One of the great moments that I always have is that the peacetime army in Britain, of which I only saw the last few months, taught not one fit fit to play games and rugby and tug of war across country, but not fit to fight. I'll give you an example of that. Um, when we first started in commando, uh, uh, the tribal drove or sergeant would say, right, get ready for PT. And people would change into shorts and a singlet and brown canvas shoes to do PT as though they were at school. But that was wrong. We said, no, this is ridiculous. You want to do PT? In your battle dress, your boots, not have Indian clubs for arm exercises, use your rifle, and so on. And uh, that was another example of uh, bringing up to date and getting uh, chaps to think in terms of preparing to fight as they have to fight. And Fairburn and Sykes brought that in. They said, You'll, be un you'll, you'll probably end up without any weapons sometime. You've either got to disarm your en uh, enemy or know how to uh, uh, either kill him or maim him or put him out of action without a weapon. And therefore, look around. What have you got? You've got boots on your feet, you know, to 
use. You don't, you don't use your hand in a certain way, and so on. And this is all part of uh, creating that uh, spirit, that offensive spirit, which became known as the commander spirit. His Sykes was the judo expert, uh, but both had got what was called the black belt in judo, and I think one of them, has can't without not record, Fairburn possibly was the first foreigner outside Japan that had a black belt. The original ones, the chaps that joined up in 40, it was an ongoing thing. It, we were being prepared for operations while we were still really training. And as a result, the earliest raids weren't successful. They were good propaganda because people did land on uh, the enemy coastline, but they weren't really successful. It was a different um, feeling, I should imagine, later on when the training center was uh, established and there was a course of six weeks to go through to get your green berry. Because initially, until the first two years, from 1940 to 42, we didn't have a green berry. We all wore our own regimental headdress, whatever it was, a tam shanter of a Scottish regiment, a fore-and-aft cap in the cavalry, a black beret for the tank people, and so on. So for us in the early days, we were in commandos, and so it was just ongoing. We didn't feel really any different after that train than we did initially, but we knew we were better. Whereas from 42 onwards, the chaps that came in had to go through the basic training and weren't a commander until they passed that. The early chaps were commandos from the start. The subtle difference. With the busy fall season already in swing, you might be looking for wholesome, convenient meals for jam-packed days. Factor, America's number one ready-to-eat meal kit, can help you fuel up fast with chef-prepared, dietitian approved ready-to-eat meals delivered straight to your door. You'll save time, eat well, and stay on track with your healthy lifestyle. Level up with Gourmet Plus options, prepared to perfection by chefs and ready-to-eat in record time. Treat yourself to upscale meals with premium ingredients like broccolini, leeks, truffle butter, and asparagus. Looking for calorie-conscious options? Try delicious, dietitian approved calorie-smart meals with around or less than 550 calories per serving. Need an extra boost to support your wellness goals and feel your best as you tackle a busy autumn? Try Protein Plus meals with 30 grams of protein or more per serving. With Factor, you can rest assured you're making a sustainable choice. We offset 100% of our delivery emissions, source 100% renewable electricity for our production sites and offices, and feature sustainably sourced seafood in our meals. This September, get Factor and enjoy eating well without the hassle. Simply choose your meals and enjoy fresh, flavor-packed meals delivered to your door. Ready in just two minutes, no prep, no mess. Head to factormeals.com slash warriors50 and use code warriors50 to get 50% off. That's code warriors50 at factormeals.com slash warriors50 to get 50% off. I'm Josh Klein. And I'm Elise Hugh. We host a podcast from Accenture called Built for Change. Every part of every business is being reinvented right now. That means companies are facing brand new pressures to use fast evolving technologies and address shifting consumer expectations. But with big changes come even bigger opportunities. We've talked with leaders from every corner of the business world to learn how they're harnessing change to totally reinvent their companies. And how you can do it too. Subscribe to Built for Change now so you don't miss an episode. Well, the big, first big one we went on was successful, the Foton Island ones. The Boulogne one, uh, it started off badly. We were towing some landing craft across the channel from Dover, and I think it was three of them. And in Sea Troop, we had two chaps in the landing craft, and it got awashed going over and subsequently sunk. And as a result... Um, the 
the guys in that uh, landing craft were drowned. But there were only two. It has been said by someone, and I've heard that it had been reported at, in a recording at the Imperial War Museum that there could have been as many as 30. But that is not true. I was troop sergeant major, second in command of the LCA, which would have been loaded, and we lost just the two, no more. I can remember their names, Crump and Hoodless. Anyway, we did land uh, there. Our particular role was to um, create a beachhead, and so that was our main task. The other troop that landed, B Troop, had uh, a variety of uh, objectives and catch a prisoner, and they had with them some experts who wanted to examine a certain installation or a type of uh, uh, defences of this installation. Uh, but I personally was not involved in that. It wasn't a spectacular raid like the Fountain Raid where you saw positive results, but it certainly, uh, according to CO and his report, uh, successful in a limited way. But it was unsuccessful in as much as uh, we didn't uh, use the right techniques for taking our landing craft across in the first attempt. The idea uh, behind the, uh, the system was to have no tail, no administrative tail. Every infantry battalion to keep the battalion uh, on the road, as it were, has to have cooks, orderlies, has to have guards and all that sort of thing. Well, if you have a system whereby you give um, the soldiers or, or lower people in the unit a ration card, and some money to find their own billets, especially as all the commanders except one were founded in seaside resorts for two reasons. One, you had access to the sea, and there's often small boats, fishing boats, or small craft to practice seamanship. And B, you had availability of lodgings and places like that which weren't being used because of the war, but would be available for billeting soldiers and landladies accustomed to providing breakfast and an evening meal for their seaside visitors. So that was fine. And that worked very well. Because we got six shillings and eightpence, which was a third of a pound sterling, uh, other units, other people often thought outside commanders it was extra pay, but it wasn't. That was for our subsistence. So that myth had to be exploded uh, later on during the war. Uh, it worked very well. It meant that unlike an infantry battalion, you had 100% of your men available for training. And Colonel Darby of the US Rangers, when after they had come over to Britain uh, in uh, 42, they had gone to Arachnacari, which was followed on following after La Caille, and had to marry up with one commando to prepare for the North African landing. And Colonel Darby's on record as saying it was a tremendous boost to the morale of his men. And for the first time, he had all his cooks and other batmen and all those sort of things out training because they had a ration card and he had 100%. And he said it was tremendous and it gave the men a lot of initiative. Instead of being embarrassed and told to get on parade in 10 minutes' time and this and that, they had to do it for themselves. They had to think about it, where they were going to be, what their equipment they were going to take. And so it stimulated initiative. To be able to react to any given situation within the framework of the main aim, to destroy the enemy. Compatible with self-sufficient was the need to, for each individual to be part of a team. And the smallest denominator for the team was two. So we introduced what was called me and my pal, which I think Americans later called me and my buddy. And then the two became a self-contained unit. And invariably, they shared a billet together. 
as they were uh, on the brain gun, they were automatically the number one and the number two, and the mortar, number one and number two. So to go back to your original thing, self-sufficient, able to cope with a situation uh, and respond to a situation with full confidence. Confidence in the order that's given, because there has to be a mutual respect and uh, loyalty between the leader of whatever rank, whether it's from the officer down to the section sergeant to the uh, Lance Torpo in charge of a little group, and uh, to have that trust and mutual respect, which came through uh, all the various aspects of training where leadership at all its levels came out, like mountaineering, rock climbing, a, a dicey situation in the water, and so on. It developed in training and was probably more applicable in training because uh, when you did a raid and came back and then trained again, uh, you had chance to uh, uh, cement any losses. But when the commandos, like in Normandy, where they were in the line for 90 days, the system uh, to a degree broke down because one might get killed and then uh, your buddy had gone, you see. So you then have to try and get another link. And possibly you became one of three or something like that. So it was an ideal situation, uh, mainly uh, in, uh, for the purpose of training, but it did stand the test of action, but it was liable to be broken up. And, of course, it could have, if you were very devoted to your buddy on power and you lost him, it could really tear a hole in here. And so there, there was a danger there, but that was met by you would, another couple would say, well, we're just after old George, you know, he's left old, lost Fred, we're having him with us, you know, and then the reinforcement would come in and heal the gap. Oddly enough, in commanders in particular, we often used to find that a bloody good soldier that is a little bit bolshy and, you know, is always moaning, we'd often, especially in Citra, I remember quite a few, and George would know them, we'd say, I'll tell you what we'll do, we'll give him a stripe, make him a lance corporal, give him some responsibility. And then instead of being a whiner and a moaner, he had to pass on the orders and he'd explain why it was necessary. And I can think of two chaps in particular who were, could have been a bit of a nuisance and we gave them stripes, gave them a bit of responsibility and they reacted and it did the trick. Initially, the concept of commando raids were small raids. Uh, the chap in charge of overall charge of small of, uh, commandos was a great buddy of Winston Churchill who'd been a, a great leader in World War I towards the Roger Keys. He, towards the end of 40, um, he had the idea that we should go for bigger raids. And he got the, uh, uh, the year of Churchill and they planned, while we were all up in Scotland, a big raid in the Mediterranean to capture an island called Pantateria in the Mediterranean, which would be used as a base to uh, operate against the Italians supplying North Africa. In the event, it was cancelled, although the commanders were sent out there, and that's another story. Following on that, the chiefs of staff and the economic advisor decided that there would be a big raid in Norway, because the Germans who were occupying Norway had developed uh, factories in the north of Norway where they were converting uh, fish oil, cod oil, into a component for nitroglycerine uh, for explosives and sending it back to Germany. So it decided to carry out a big raid, two commandos, number three and number four, to the islands of Lofoten, up, went into the Arctic Circle and uh, destroy these factories and the fishing fleet which were uh, uh, producing this substitute for nitroglycerine. So off we went. Uh, we stayed at Scapa. 
We had detailed plans. I was then a sergeant in uh, uh, um, F Troop, and we had a specific task. I had to land with my little group, and I had a house to go to and to get at a chap who was the manager of a little factory, and he would take us into the factory, and we would destroy everything in there. And all of us had tasks like that. Another troop had to go and surround a little barracks where the Germans were located and uh, either capture or destroy them. And so the landing, which uh, was up the field, was carried out with complete surprise. We were all dreading it, well, not dreading it, but apprehensive that we'd be shot up going in, but we weren't. We got in with complete surprise. And the um, whole raid, it sounds almost fantastic. We destroyed something like uh, 16 or 17 factories. When I say factories, they were small units, uh, not great big things like you're used to in the States, as called factory, but they were producing uh, this oil. And it was stored in great tanks. And we destroyed something like 800,000 gallons of this oil. Uh, we sunk uh, with explosives and uh, depth charges something like 18 ships. Uh, we captured 200 uh, odd German prisoners and we brought back 300 Norwegians without one single loss. There was only one person injured, and that was an officer who shot himself in his leg taking the holster out from a leg holster. It was a fantastic achievement and is often uh, decried because it, it, there was no fighting hardly. But the, the group that captured the main group of uh, German prisoners got to this uh, uh, small barracks where there were over 100 and they surrounded it and it was just before their revalli and they, had, they knew that they had uh, a sort of parade first thing and they waited until they paraded before they fired and the Germans had no weapons with them they weren't expecting it was the most extraordinary success story of that which because it was no battle has often just been neglected so that was the Lofoten Islands and of course it was a great boost of morale back here bring back 200 odd prisoners see them landing you know and in uh, Scrapaplo because it was a time in uh, March 1941 uh, when there was heavy blitz in London. So it was a, a, a good morale booster. That was Major James Dunning. Next time on Warriors in Their Own Words, he'll describe the infamous Dieppe raid and how he became an instructor at the Achnacary Castle. To learn more about Dunning and his experiences, check out his book, The Fighting Fourth. The link is in the show description. Thanks for listening to Warriors in Their Own Words. If you have any feedback, please email the team at kharbaugh at evergreenpodcasts.com. We're always looking to improve the show. For updates and more, follow us on Twitter at team underscore Harbaugh. And if you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to rate and review. Warriors in Their Own Words is a production of Evergreen Podcasts in partnership with The Honor Project. Our producer is Declan Roars. Bridget Coyne is our production director, and Sean Rolhoffman is our audio engineer. Special thanks to Evergreen executive producers Joan Andrews, Michael DeAloya, and David Moss. I'm Ken Harbaugh, and this is Warriors in Their Own Words. This is Peter. And this is Tom. We want to tell you guys a little bit about our podcast. Tom and I met in college, became best friends, and then teachers almost 20 years ago. Sometimes school just does not allow us to elaborate on the topics that we find interesting, like the real shark attacks that inspired the movie Jaws, or the real historical context to Indiana Jones artifacts. Where does cereal come from? Or are zombies real? Does Ben Franklin really deserve to be on a $100 bill? On our podcast, just like in our class, there are no stupid questions. Just two friends having a lighthearted conversation about history, pop culture, and the context of current events. Listen to History Teachers Talking Podcast from Evergreen Network, anywhere you get your podcasts.